morning. How are you today? Good to see you. If you're joining us online, we're so glad. Welcome. We are in this series. We're talking about next steps. What's next for the next decade? I mean, we just turned the corner on a whole nother decade. So let's get this right. You know, for most of us, we want our next decade to maybe be different than the previous one. So so let's, let's get in the right direction and start making the right steps. So we're talking about that, and we're going to continue that today. Some of the practical things that we talked about, your spiritual next step here uh, we're doing together is we're doing something called 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. So we always start our new year with that because coming out of Christmas, we're, there's lots of food and lots of uh, consumption. It's just a time to maybe fast, which, and, and I know for somebody that's new, that just means you, 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 you don't do something for these 21 days and in its place, something of the world, not necessarily bad. And in its place, you just focus a little more on prayer. So some people are doing meals. Some people are doing uh, soda or caffeine. Some people are doing media, like social media or something, but just something where you just say, that's a little too dominating in my life. I think I'll give that up. For 21 days. Now, if you're just joining us with us, and you're saying, hey, I didn't know anything about that. Hey, it's not too late. Welcome to seven days of prayer and fasting for you. <laughs> hey, come on, join us. You know, who says you have to do all 21 days? Do seven. That'll be great. And so uh, Saturday will be the last day of the, of the prayer and fasting. Not that you have to, you know, sometimes people's lives change. In fact, let me just say this. Some of the amazing things that happens in people's lives through 21 days of prayer and fasting often happens the last week. So be anticipating that because you've been praying and you've been seeking God and sometimes there's just a breakthrough happens and it's usually many, many times it's the last week. So I'm super excited for you. And then we want to celebrate that last day on Saturday morning together here, 930 uh, you'll want to, if you can be here, make sure and be here. And we have child care and some coffee and stuff. But it's just one hour of just celebrating that last day of, uh, of, of the 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I hope you can join us. And now we've been, the series we're doing is following along a book called What's Next by Chris Hodges. And he's going to be coming to our conference that we have and we do every other year. And this year it's called Max Influence. It's a way to really use our influence. Whatever level of influence you have, we want to up your game on that. And so we have Chris Hodges coming in, an international speaker. Uh, we actually secured him over a year ago to get him here. And we have another Charles Montgomery, great, another nationally well-known speaker. And, uh, and just some amazing things that are going to happen. You'll want the whole two days off. Take it off as vacation days. And then you say, well, that cut into two of my vacation days. Well, when you're on vacation, just call in sick a couple days. You know? <laughs> but, but don't do it on this one, okay? This one just are like legit. Get, you know, vacation days. Listen, it's, I've always given some of my vacation days when I worked at Costco for 10 years and, and just in and, and, and my schedule, I always try to make sure and have some time where I'm sewing into what God has for my life. And so this is a great opportunity for you to do that. Now, as we go into this, this, uh, this series and we're in part three, we're talking today about God's purpose for your life. And there's nothing more frustrating than to not know what God's purpose is for your life. You're just kind of like, what do I do? I'm not sure. And you're just kind of, and in fact, there's a Bible verse that I think describes it really well. It says if people can't see what God's doing, when you don't know what God's doing in your life, they stumble all over themselves. And so often that you can relate to that. You go, hey, that's how I feel. You know, I'm stumbling all over my job. You know, I'm stumbling all over my marriage. I'm stumbling all over my finances. I'm stumbling all over my emotions. I mean, when we, when we lack clarity, when we lack of direction of what God has for us, we stumble. We stumble. And he says, but when they attend to what he reveals, so God's in the process of revealing, we're going to talk about that today, they're most blessed. Now, blessed doesn't necessarily mean you have a lot of material stuff, a lot of money. That, that is a blessing, but what it means is, that your inmost part, your soul is satisfied. There's something that money can't do, entertainment can't do, other people can't really do. It. It's something God does where we're deeply satisfied in our soul, in, our, in the in part of us. And so that's what it means. And you want that kind of blessing. He goes, he's going to reveal it. God is interested in revealing it. And he reveals what 
we like to refer to as the path of life. No, God has a path, a way for you to follow. He says, you will show me the way of life. God's got a way, and he reveals it, kind of like a progression. You go here, then you go here, then you go here. That's why you hear a lot about next steps. Everybody has a next step. I have one. You have one. You never get to a place where you say, I'm done. No, we're all in this, this progressive growth with God, and he has a path for us. And he goes, when we, when, when we are on the path of life, he goes, he grants us joy of his presence and the pleasure of living with you forever. Now, the world is looking for joy and pleasure, and God says, no, actually, real joy, the pleasures of living with God, that comes from discovering this path of life, this way of life that God has for you. And if you look throughout the Bible, you see all through it that God has four key things he wants you to to discover in your life. Four things that he wants you to grab a hold of and that will give you the joy and the pleasures of living. And so we talk about that in terms that are easy for everybody to understand. You may have never gone to church in your whole life. This is your first day. Or you're just dialing in online. This is your first time you've ever watched a church service. You'll understand this. You'll get this. Watch this. Four things. Number one. It says he wants you to know him. Now, when, when it, the Bible, when it talks about knowing God, it's not referring to a head knowledge. It's not saying, oh, I need to do certain like rules and rituals. That's not what he's talking about. Because God doesn't, he's not looking for more religious people. In fact, Jesus, he, was, he wasn't religious at all. If you read the Gospels. I mean, he, he actually upset the religious people because he wasn't religious enough. Did you know that? I mean, they were like always upset at him. The people that liked him were their ill religious people. They were saying, hey, man, you'd love our party. Come on, Jesus. You know, you'll fit right in. Cool. Jesus would show up. Now, he, he loved the Lord, but he wasn't religious. So what he's talking about is knowing God is not about becoming religious, certainly not becoming more religious. It's about having a relationship with God where you, you're friends with him through Christ. And that's a big part of that is knowing God and then Finding freedom, that's the next path. Now here, you cannot find freedom if you don't know God because you don't have the power of God in your life. When you know God, God helps you. His power, His resurrection power helps you to take that next step, which is finding freedom. Finding freedom when you, here's, what, here's the way I like to describe finding freedom. The thing in your life that you knew if it wasn't there, your life would be better. God wants you to be free from that. You can be free. And until you settled yesterday, you can't really move into your future. What God has for you, you can't move and move forward in that. You're stuck in the, the, the regrets of yesterday, the unforgiveness, the shame, all those kinds of things. They, they hold you captive. You are not free. And so God wants you to know him. He wants you to find freedom. And then he wants you to discover purpose. He's got a purpose for you. He really does, and we're going to talk about that today. But he's got a purpose for you. And a lot of people, they don't know their purpose. In fact, seminaries, there's some seminaries that have done surveys among churches. So it's it's not people outside of church. This is people in the church. And they have discovered that 87% of people in churches do not know their purpose. They don't know their purpose. Now, that's, that's not good, okay? Because the Bible says the church is the body of Christ. Jesus said that. He goes, the church is the body of Christ. That's that's what he refers to the church. And so each part of the body has a purpose, right? Your fingers have a purpose, your mouth, your eyes, your ears, your liver, all those, everything's got a purpose. What if 87% of my body didn't know its purpose? That'd be a problem. I'd probably be in a wheelchair, right? Or dead. I mean, I don't even know you can live 87%. That's probably why so many churches throughout the country are so ineffective because people don't know their purpose. And so here in the vineyard from day one, 25 years ago when Sharon and I started this church, this, we set out, we, wanna, we want people to know their purpose, their purpose. Like I said, we're going to talk more about that today. And then to make a difference, not, not just make a difference in a little way, but God wants you to really make a difference. He wants you to make a difference in people's eternity and people's lives here and now. Now, in our church, our vision, we try to accomplish 
all four of these. We believe all four of them are important. That God wants all four of them to happen in your life. And so they're inter- that, that's part of our vision. That's what we want. And so in our church, our weekend services, which is Saturday night service, and then our two Sunday morning services, and those who join us online, that is where we help people to know God in a personal way. And so if knowing God happens on our weekend services, then finding freedom happens in our small groups where you can really just open up and share and be yourself. And through that process, as God is there, people start to step out of that thing that held them back and they, be, and they find freedom. That's why we talk about freedom all the time in our, and, and connected to small groups. Our small group launch is in just two weeks. So I'm, I'm praying for you that you will find a group of people that you can connect with and that God will set you free from some of those things. It can happen. It will happen if you step out and you, and you say, you know what, some of you, you, you've never been in a small group. This is your moment. This is your moment. The, I, this is the year stepping into 2020. No more excuses. I'm going to be in a small group. And then discover your purpose is a big part. And then make a difference. Make a difference is part of our dream team. Our dream team helps to make that happen. People that are, have figured out their purpose, they know that, how God's wired them and designed them, and we're doing it together to impact people's eternity. And we're serving in all kinds of ways. Some down in Mexico on our missions or on food pantry and different ways that we do in meeting people's practical needs. And, and it's, it's, of course, serving on weekend services so people can find Christ, making a difference. But if... if if knowing God happens in our weekend services and finding freedom happens in small groups and making a difference happens on our dream team, how does Discover Purpose happen? In our church, it's growth track. You'll hear that all the time. Growth track, growth track, growth track, right? It's the only announcement we say every week. You're going, yeah, I believe that. It's true because we want everyone to be part of growth track, growth track, growth track. Today is growth track step three. You don't have to take step one and two. Just jump right in, right after service, right after every service. We do it every month of the year, every month, even in December. All the Christmas stuff going on, we're there because it's important. And and we do it in a way that's easy to remember. Step one is the first weekend of the month. Step two is the second weekend of the month. So it's just real easy to remember. So what I ask you to do, I don't need your whole life. I just need four hours, four hours. For you to choose a month, say this month I can give four hours, I can stay late after church for, for, for this one month and just take step one, two, three, and four and watch what God does in your life. Watch what he does and then get on the dream team and be part of that. So God has a great plan for you. Now, when you're discovering God's purpose for you, here's some advice. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. You know, this world has ways that they are going to suggest to you that you will find happiness, you will find fulfillment if you do what the world says. But it doesn't. And most of us have tried that. We've tried what the world offers, and we go, ah, that's not as fulfilling as, as I was promised. I thought that was going to give me a bigger hit, a bigger, a, bigger, a, a bigger high, a bigger, you know, excitement. But he says, no, there's, there's customs of this world, and when you pursue the world's ways, you act like the world. I mean, if you wonder, well, why do I still have, the, you know, why am I rude? Why, can't, why do I still unforgive? Why am I uncivil? Why am I impatient? Why do I steal? Why do I have these compulsions, even if you don't act on them? You know, you just, why do I have all of these, these, uh, these, these impulses to do wrong, to lie? Well, listen, when you pursue the world's ways, you end up acting like the world. So God says, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to not do the behaviors and the customs of the world. But he, notice he says, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. That's one of the reasons the Bible, reading the Bible, we talk about that a lot. What, you know why the devil doesn't want you to read the Bible? Why you're always too busy to read the Bible? Why it's always, there's always something more convenient? Because he knows that, the devil knows if you're in the Bible, God's changing the way you see things. He's changing the way you think. And that changes everything. In fact, today's message, I'm hoping to change the way you think. I'm change, I hope to change the way you view yourself because God cares about you and he's got a purpose for you. And some of you have bought into a lie that says you have no purpose, that you are just 
an overgrown, you know, amoeba or whatever. You're going, Andy, come on. You don't believe in science. I believe in science. I do. I love science. It's a, it's, I, really, I loved it in school. I still I read stuff all the time. I love science. But listen, God and science, it's the atheist who tries to make them seem like they have to be one or the other. That's a narrative they push. One, faith or science. No, it's not like that. Listen, I go to the doctor when I'm sick, but I also ask for prayer. You know, I, I, I think I believe in science and I want antibiotics or whatever I need, but I also want prayer because I believe God does divine healing. See, God does, in fact, you know what? Here's how much God believes in science. He created the whole universe. So I, I, that says it for me. I mean, he, he's, he's, got, he's got the deal. But uh, changing the way you think. Sometimes we let the world tell us we're below what God says about us. And so we need to change the way we view ourselves. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Let me give you the enemies of purpose. One is confusion. 1 Corinthians 12, he says, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant about your spiritual gifts. The things, the way God's hardwired you, the way he's designed you. He goes, I don't want you to be ignorant or confused about it. You've got to be clear on that which is what we talk about in growth track. So that's one. Another is comparison. You, if you're always looking at somebody else's life and longing for their life, oh, I wish I had their marriage. Oh, I wish I had their house. Oh, I wish I could take vacations like them. Boy, look at their body. I wish my body was like that. Look at their hair. I wish my hair was like that. I mean, you know, on and on and on. And, you know, one of the ways that happens is in Instagram and in Facebook. You look at it, and you, all these people have a great life, and yours sucks. You're thinking, dang, man, I don't have a life like that. Listen, they don't have a life like that. That is their highlight reel. That's the one picture that out of all they took, that well, it looks okay. A couple filters, I'm good to go. And then you look at it, and you go, oh, look at that. They're having so much fun. They have, such, they have the life. Listen, when you long after other people's position, other people's portion that they have, other people's place, you will miss what God has for you. You will miss it. So don't let comparison do it. And then also counterfeit. You know, there is a counterfeit. You, people often discover, you know, figure out, hey, I, 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 I'm good at these things. And they use it to serve themselves. They think it's just to advance themselves, their own career or something. And, 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 and it feels kind of right because they're using some of the things that God's put in them. But God gave us gifts so we can serve others. Listen, some of you, you do not need a career. You need a calling. You need a calling. And often we can get sidetracked where it's all about having a career or having, you know, a counterfeit that doesn't really satisfy us. Look at this verse. I love this. In Ephesians, he says, even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny. Even before you were born. Oh, Lord, help everyone here. Everyone listening, Lord, help them to get this. That, they, that this is truth, my friends. That God did not make you and then come up with a plan for you. You know, like you're made and oh, i got to do something with this person. Let me see. What's, uh, let's make them this. No, he thought about you. He created you in his mind. He had a plan for you first, and then he made you. Because God is the great architect. He's the great designer. He designs first, and then he makes. And so God says, that's what he's, right here, he says, even before you were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. So God's planned up front. He wants you to follow it. Now, this is actually good news. It's good news that God has already created a pathway for me. I just need to follow it. I need to walk in that. Look at this verse here. It says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. There's David. He's talking about how God intricately designed us. You say, well, you mean he created uh, the wants and the desires I have? He did. The, 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 not just what we, he, he wants us to, the, the way we think, the way we process things, the way we long for things, the, de, the, the desires of our heart. He put those desires in there. He knit you together in your mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know full well. Sounds like David's like 
arrogant or something. Yeah, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. No, he knows. He's a child of God. He knows that. And so he, he gets that. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. See, understanding God oversees you. God cares about you. He has a plan for you. And he's ordained it from the very beginning. And to know that right now, right here, and to embrace that, that's a big part of how of taking those steps towards experiencing what God has for you. Let me give you four ways that we see in the Bible that people discover their purpose. Four ways. Number one is, is some people, they get it from, from very young. It's a call from birth. And they just understand it. You know, God's done something. Sometimes you'll, maybe you've talked to people. Maybe it's you. We say, oh, I've always sensed God has this thing I'm supposed to do. And you, could, you, you understood it. And, and sometimes what happens is life comes and we end up in a different direction. I was talking to this young lady recently. Uh, she said ever since she was real young, her parents had a plan for her. Said, oh, you're supposed to go on this pathway. You're supposed to do this. And they sent her to summer camps to reinforce that. And all through college, all, she ended up in that career field. And she realized, you know, that was never what I was supposed to do. That was my parents' you know, decisions for me. That's what they wanted. So she's decided to change directions. Good for her. So th- it can be like that. It can be when we just kind of get into massive amounts of debt, and then that we feel like our hand is forced. We can't really do what we're called to do, or we get married and have kids, and next thing we know, we just life goes by, and, and we miss that. And he says, you know, that he calls us from birth. I love, the, this is a great quintessential example, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is so good at it. He says, God speaking, he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. There it is again. There's just many verses like this, which is why I believe that when a baby is inside a mother's womb, it's a life. It's not just a blob. It's not like you know, I know in our country, we're kind of, well, th- that baby has no rights. In fact, they won't even say it's a baby, right? It's, it's a fetus. The fetus has no rights. And the minute it's born, all of a sudden it's a baby and it has rights. And, but that's not what we read in the Bible. The Bible says, no, that's a life inside of you. are saying, Andy, are you pro-life? Yeah, I'm pro-life. Because the Bible's pro-life. The Bible is pro-life. It says, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. This is a word for some of you. God has set some of you apart. And you need to embrace that. In fact, some of you, that's, as I said that, that just resonated. Those it's words real similar to that, or those exact words have been spoken over you, or you know about it. And, and you're saying, and, and I'm telling you, God wants you to step into his calling for you. You've been set apart. I've appointed you as a prophet to the nations, he says to Jeremiah. Now, how does Jeremiah respond? He goes, well, uh, uh, alas. It's not the word we always use, right? Alas. <laughs> I might start using that, though, you know. God tells me to do something. Alas, sovereign Lord. I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. So the first thing he does when God gives him an assignment is he he throws up this, I can't do that. Where did he get that from? His resume. He looks at his resume. He goes, no, what you're asking, haven't you read my resume? I can't do that job. And so often we disqualify ourselves. God wants us to do something. And, you, and listen, if you're going to fulfill your purpose, you can't disqualify yourself because God always calls us to do something bigger than we're capable to do on ourselves. We just can't do it because God's big. He, in, in the Bible, you see every time God calls him to something bigger, he, he never calls us to do something easy. That's easy. I don't even need faith for that. Well, thanks, God. That, no, actually, part of the adventure is in doing something big, watching God move on your behalf. But he says, hey, I'm too young. Uh, so he uses an excuse. You know, I, in, in school, in high school, I was so terrified of public speaking. I, I ended up not speaking and just got, and then I was forced to speak, and I, like, choked up and couldn't speak. I just, and I, like, failed, and I think I got a D because I begged. And then look at what God called me to do. I mean, I hate public speaking, and here I am, da da, you know, <laughs> doing what God told me to do. <laughs> and I'm so glad I, I said yes to God. I said yes. So he says, and that knows what God says. He goes, oh, don't say that. 
Don't just look at your resume. Don't say that I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid. Look, we're always going to struggle with fear when we're, doing some, when we're outside of our comfort zone. When God's calling us to do something bigger than we would imagine on our own, there's always fear. He goes, don't be afraid of them. For I am with you and will res- rescue you, declares the Lord. Great, great, uh, clear message on, hey, God has a purpose for you. Okay? Number two is this growing awareness. Sometimes it just, it, it kind of comes as, as, you, uh, as you discover yourself and discover, you know, you start trusting God and, and obeying Him and God starts doing some, some amazing things in your life. So a great example of this is Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph was, he had uh, 11 brothers, it was 12 total, and, and uh, his, he had, 10 of his brothers were older than him. And so he had a dream. He had a dream that, were, that all these nations were going to serve Joseph. They were going to bow down. And in his dream, they were bowing down and including his brothers, his older brothers. Now, Joseph, he did something kind of dumb. He, he woke up. Can't wait to tell my brothers. And he goes to his older brothers. He goes, guess what? I just had this dream. You're going to serve me. Isn't that awesome? Well, they didn't see it that way. They throw him down a pit. They're so upset at him. And then they sell him into slavery. And then he goes to slavery and he lives in in, in slavery for years in this house down in Egypt. And then he's falsely accused and ends up in prison. Now listen, God had given him a dream, but it seemed like every time he made a decision, every time he moved forward, it was the wrong turn. I, no, no, I need to be going this way. I'm supposed to be ruler of the nations here. I'm, I'm in slavery. I'm in a pit. I'm in slavery. Now I'm in prison. How do, you end up the, how do you end up the leader of all of Egypt? He ends up second in charge. He's, everybody is in, he's in over everybody. Because God was part of that. God all along the way was part of that. And God can do that. So it's so often we'll... We'll just say, you know, I've made these, you know, I, I'm divorced now. God can't use me. I've, you know, have this on my, you know, I have a criminal record or whatever. I've done this. I've made a mistake here. And, 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 we, and we look at all the wrong turns that we've made. And it might not have been bad. Just, it's not the direction. We, God wants us to go here. And, but listen, God used, in Joseph's life, he used every one of those wrong turns actually to bring him to his purpose. It's like you almost read it and think, there's no other way it could have happened than this. He had to go through that. He, but it looked like he had wasted the majority of his young adult life. It's a terrific story. It's in Genesis. Start, this is one of the best stories in all the Bible. It starts in Genesis chapter 30, goes all the way to ta- chapter 50. And at the very end, he gets a chance to confront his brothers who did all this to him. They don't even realize it's him because he's been away so long. You know, he speaks Egyptian, he looks Egyptian, and, uh, and then he reveals, hey, I am Joseph. And they're going, oh no, he has the power to kill me. <laughs> he has the power to really get me back, you know. This is not good. And I love what he says here. He says, you, Joseph's talking to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. God intended it. My friends, this is a new way of thinking. Because all of us have had people that have offended us. That we feel like it's because of them, we can't really do the, our very, we can't live our very best life that God has for us. And I am here to tell you that that is not true. That God uses all wrong turns you made and other people made for you to help advance and accomplish His will. He goes to accomplish what is now being done. And notice the saving of many lives. Your purpose, everyone in here, God's purpose, that's true for all of us. God's purpose in your life will include the saving of lives. That's his passion. That's in the great commandment. It's really part of the great commission. He's very, very impassioned about the saving of lives. That's why we invite people. That's what, to to our weekend services, because we want them to know God. That's why you invite people that you don't even like. Because really, that would be the best way to get them back, right? I'm not inviting you to church. Hope it works out for you. 
Right? You can get somebody back. We invite people we don't even like because we want them to be saved. We want them, God's always interested in the saving of lives. And that's part of God's purpose for you. That's part of his plan. And then there's walking through open doors. Sometimes you just have to walk through a door. You don't know what's on the other side. And so it's scary. You think, oh, I'd like to know. I don't, I'm not that, you know, risk-taking type of person. Well, you know, most people would like to know what's on the other side. But that's not the way God works. It's part of faith, walking through it. And then once you go through it, you discover, oh, God uses that in my life. That's a door I had to walk through in order for something else to happen. A great example of this in the Bible is Esther. Esther, she was, when she was very young, her parents were, were both, both died. And so she was in, she's Jewish, but she's in a, 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 another culture, a Babylonian culture. And, and so she's kind of a misfit in that culture. She's, she, she's Jewish and it's, you know, they're, they're not really uh, uh, very well supported there. Some people don't even like the Jews. And, and, and so it's, it's very difficult. Well, the king, who is a pagan king, he decides to have his queen parade in front of all of his guy friends at some party. They're all drinking, and he goes, I'll, I'll just bring my, my wife. You can check her out. And he sends a message, hey, babe, come on, check. You know, everybody wants to check you out. And she goes, no, babe, I'm not coming. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Well, he gets so upset, he fires her as queen. Then he needs to bring in another queen. So he does a beauty pageant. So all these beautiful women, they bring in some Jewish women as well. well Esther so beautiful. She ends up winning the beauty pageant, becoming queen. Well, there's a guy on the king's council. His name is Haman. He wants to kill all the Jews. And he's been plotting this for a long time now. And now he comes up with this plan to execute all the Jews, every single Jew in the whole land, the whole known world. You go, well, that sounds like Hitler. Well, yeah. I mean, listen, there is that, that, uh, that's a demon spirit that... Even though people die, demons don't. And so they, so they just, they, 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 they go from Haman to Hitler to different people. And, and, and different generations all throughout the, the world, that's always been a spirit, a demon spirit trying to kill the Jewish people. So this guy has this plan, he concocts it. And Esther's, uh, her, her relative, her uncle Mordecai comes and says, listen, I have a message for you, Esther. Remember when you won that beauty pageant? She goes, yeah. Well, listen. It was, there's a reason for it. It wasn't just become queen. And then he explains this to her. Here's what he says. For if you remain silent at this time, this is about, in other words, he's saying, you have the king's heir and you know what's going down with Haman. And she's Jewish, even though the king doesn't realize it at the time. He goes, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. No, the, you know, Haman's plan, it's going to fold in on you. And, you. and who knows? I love that phrase. Who knows? Well, God knows. Who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. In other words, to have the ear of the king. In other words, she just saw her position as, hey, I'm queen. I've got a good deal going. And all of a sudden now she has to possibly lose everything to save the lives of other people. It's always about saving the lives of other people. And so she, she does that. She responds that way. She goes, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. So she's willing to do that. But she had to walk through that door. God gives you opportunities. And a lot of times you don't, we're not aware that it's an opportunity that goes somewhere else. That he opens up something else through that opportunity. It's not just to serve yourself. God has a bigger agenda. And then lastly, God encounters. Sometimes God just comes sovereignly right into your life, suddenly, out of nowhere. I mean, you were kind of going this direction, and boom, God speaks to you. And a great example of this is Saul. It's Paul, as we know him. He wrote most of the New Testament. But before he was a Christian, he was referred to as Saul. And Saul hated Christians. So much so, he, was, he helped orchestrate people murdering Christians. The f in fact, the very first martyr, Christian martyr, who was Stephen, was killed, and Saul was kind of the ringleader. He was in charge of it. 
He didn't even have to throw rocks. He was like in charge of watching people's coats and orchestrating. He was really influential. He goes to the high priest and says, hey, I want a contract. I'm tired of these Christians. And I, I, I want to be your hitman. I want to go. We're going to hunt them down in Jerusalem and in other cities like Damascus. Hunt them down and imprison them, torture them, and even kill them. The San, and the, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the, uh, the high priest, they were good with that. Yeah, go ahead and do that. So he's on his way to the city Damascus. Meanwhile, when Saul was still breathing out murder threats against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus. So that, he, if, so that if he found any there who belonging to the way, that's what they call Christians at the time, belonging, those who belong to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly. And I've been praying for you this week that you would have a suddenly moment. You know, you're just kind of doing your own thing, just making things work, going through the motions, and... Everything can change when God enters in. Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. Now, that might not be your experience. In fact, in the Bible, we, God never does the same thing twice. Moses, he was 80 years old. He's walking along. He's a shepherd of the time. Goes by this, this bush that is on fire and doesn't get consumed. It's a burning bush. Then God starts talking to him through the bush. That's a unique, that never happened again. That was one time, that was for Moses. It, just, it, it, was, it was hand carved for him. I love that story, by the way, because he's 80 and God has a new purpose for him. Some of you, you when you get older, you think, oh, okay, I need to think of retirement. I, I mean, all that purpose does for younger people. No, no, no. God did it over and over, whether it was Abraham or Moses, I mean, Joshua. I mean, God, new purpose. And for some of you, he's got a new purpose even in your latter years, flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice. God spoke to him. Say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, he was persecuting Christians, but Jesus is saying, no, you're actually persecuting me. Now, get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Some of you, this is the message for you. Get up and go. It's 2020. You've been thinking about it. You've been meditating on it. You've been worried over it. You're you're not sure, how do I make the finances work? How do I get the resources? How do I get people to come alongside me? How do I get the courage to do it? Here's what God says to you. Get up and go. And watch what God does. Get up and go. No. Here's the summary of today's message right here. The summary. God created me on purpose for a purpose. God created me on purpose for a purpose. I want, I want you to just hear that without, without your eyes open. Would you close your eyes? Let me just say that over to you. I want to speak that over to you. God created you on purpose for a purpose. God created you on purpose, for a purpose. And then just say that to yourself. God created me on purpose, for a purpose. God, I thank you. Right now in this moment, Lord, come. Reveal yourself. Do something suddenly. Lord, I pray that you change our way of viewing ourselves change our thinking god help us each one of us take that next step to identify it to say yeah i need to do that i need to get baptized i need to get in a small group i need to go to growth track i need to get on the dream team and and be part of that or whatever your next step is heavenly father just come do a work that only you can do Because when the day's done, it's really just, I'm just a talking head. We can do some music. We can try to make it a nice environment here. But in the end, we we know that you alone transform the hearts and minds of people. And so we invite you, Lord, do that today. If you are here and you're saying, 
I'm not that close to God. Or maybe you're online and you're, you're there and you're saying, I don't feel like he's that close. He's not my friend. You've never taken that step. Or maybe you did and it's been years ago. You're far from God today. Then today I want to invite you to pray with me. Say, you know what? I'm all in. I was praying right before this service and I felt like God said for me to tell you that that's what you're to pray. God, I'm in. Count me in. And if that's the prayer you want to say right now, God, count me in. I'm in. I want to, make, I want to follow you. Then I'm going to invite you to pray with me. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. And just where you're at with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you do that for me? Close your eyes and bow your heads. Because some of you are make, going to make an important decision. And I'm, and I, and I'm just going to just invite you to pray with me, okay? This is not about joining the church. This is about saying yes. Say, God, I'm in. I want to follow you. And if that's you, and I'm going to pray, and I want you to follow me in prayer, but so that I know who I'm praying for, I'm going to ask you right where you're at, boldly, right now, confidently, just raise your hand up right now. Say, I'm in. I want, I'm going to pray with you. Bless you. Okay? I see hands all around, all in the back. Some of you, come on, I'm going to, you'll put your hands down in a moment. There's some more. To say, I'm in on that prayer. Boldly, say yes. Okay, all of them, put your hands down. This is your moment right now. Would you say this to God? Say, God, I want to serve you. I want to be blessed in my soul. You say, help me to know you. And then just say, God, forgive me for my sin. Cleanse me. Cleanse my conscience. Give me a fresh start. And give me your power to live the life that I want to live. You say, God, help me to start this path of finding freedom, discovering purpose, and making a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.